What we will do now is to take some examples. I'll take two examples. I worked on one of them as a consulting project and was very interesting. I learned a lot. This was a rust proofing company in Sweden. The name of the company was Dinol, D-I-N-O-L. It was the largest rust proofing company at that time in the world in the 80s. It was just bought out by an oil company because in rust proofing business, you need a lot of petrochemicals that you apply for rust proofing. So the oil company, which had a lot of money after the energy crisis, wanted to downstream, which means buy a vertical market, as we talked about earlier, an application. They went into that area. And they bought out this company. This Dinol also had bought, before its acquisition, a franchise company in America, which is called Tuffcoat, T-U-F-F-K-O-T-E, -F -F -E, a Detroit-based franchise company, rust proofing business. That is how they entered the American market. Now, I was brought in as an advisor to say what to do with this business. I used this framework. And the idea was that, look, rust proofing business will have a short-term problem and a long-term problem. Short-term problem is that since they are an aftermarket, which means after the car is sold, they get a business. There's always a demand of a new car has a three-year cycle. Three-year it is boom, three-year it is bust kind of a thing. So at that time, they were in a downturn cycle, so they knew the demand for the next three years for rust proofing will be low. But their biggest worry was the long term, that more and more automobile companies were doing rust proofing at the factory assembly level, and therefore there is no aftermarket. Remember earlier I talked about you need two core competencies? So we did the plotting of two core competencies. So I have a chart here in this example that I have. You can see they are in the rust proofing business, and they are primarily rust proofing new cars. And uh, by the way, it took me a lot of time to get these two words right from the management team. There was a group dynamics that was very fascinating. The Dinol company and the Dinol franchise in Europe was run by a young Swedish engineer. Tuffcoat as a franchise operation primarily was a, basically a marketing guy. Remember, we talked about you need two core competencies. In this case, you had two individuals and two divisions having each one one core competency and not the other. The Tuffcoat guy was strictly the son of the founder. And these two individuals didn't get along. So the first debate was that, yes, the parent company has hired this professor. He would be our advisor and a guide. Where do we meet? Since I was in uh, Illinois at that time, and uh, Tough Court was in Detroit, they said, why don't we meet in New York halfway, kind of a notion, but in America. The Tough Court people said, we are Swedish. We own you. Why don't we meet in Sweden? And this debate went on. And after three weeks, finally we resolved that we will meet in Ireland. Isn't that interesting? That's the first tip off that there's something wrong in this company. In fact, this chart is so important to crystallize conflict within the organization. Once you are out of the box, box number one, whether you want to go horizontally or vertically is a typical conflict in most companies that I have uh, used this chart to understand uh, the growth of the core business by and large, interestingly. So we met in Ireland. It took quite a lot of time to put these words together, right? I said, let's look at your current revenues and current profits to define not what you want to be, not what you have been. Let's look at your current reality. And we finally forced that thing. And we came out the word that, yes, we are in the rust proofing business. And the things we rust proof is mostly, in fact, the only thing we do is new automobiles. Then we said, let's look at your core competency. The operational core competency primarily is the quality of the petrochemicals or anti-corrosive chemicals, essentially. So I put the word specialty chemicals is your core competency. You are far better in anti-corrosive chemicals than your competition. Across the line, marketing core competency was their franchise system. They were very good in their franchise system. This franchise like McDonald's, you know, Burger King that you can think about, interestingly. So we put the two together 
And we said, all right. Of course, the tough court person wanted to go across because he believes it's the franchise system which is more important, and franchise system is the one on which we can add more and more products. So we, de we debated that thing, OK? What else can you do to a new car was the idea. Since you rust-proof the car, which is the belly of the car, can you do something else? I mean, what does rust-proofing do to the car, which is a good question to ask, because you can identify something else. So we said, of course, rust-proofing is done to protect the car, but it's only belly of the car. So now the question is, can we do car protection? Remember, you are now changing business from rust proofing, broadening the horizon to say, I'm in the car protection business, the next box in the chart. And you are now going to talk about what else can you protect the car from? So here are the ideas that emerged. You can protect the interior upholstery of the car. <clears throat> so you have to look at your competition. Is there a market there? We found out, yes, it was a growing business. More and more people wanted, in fact, <coughs> I'm sorry, more and more people wanted, in fact, something to protect the fabric, the leather interior, whatever it is. So one could come out with a scotch guard kind of a technology, right? In fact, it turns out very interestingly, how do you protect the car? Who is your entrenched competition? Prior to this technology, guess what? Most people basically put a fabric or something like that, which is very hard to, it's the second worst product I have found, by the way. So the notion here was that we are not just in the rust proofing business. That business is going to go out of business, essentially. And therefore, we need to do something differently. Well, first point was very clear that why don't we stay in box number one? What do you think they should do as a strategy? They were already doing the rust proofing for Volvo at the factory. So the simple idea was that you should become what we call an OEM supplier, close down all the retail franchises. You don't need them anymore. Simply line up with five or six major car producers, put the rust proofing technology at the assembly line, and you will actually make more money. You will get rid of all your marketing costs, all your advertising dollars, et cetera, right? But if I am the tough court franchise, vice president of franchise operations, guess what? My, my, I'm out of business. I have nobody, no budget, nothing. So I would resist it enormously. So strategy was staring at them. But because of the internal core competency, in this case, core competency had become a core trap. We therefore carried out the scenario planning to say, all right, if we have to use existing franchise system, what else can we do in terms of products and services other than rust proofing? Rust proofing business will continue, may decline, but we add more products. That was the idea. So we went horizontally. And the idea is that, OK, we go back to the thinking, what does rust proofing do? It protects the car, but it protects the belly, the guts of the car. So we came out with the idea you can also protect the fabric of the car, which is like a scotch guard technology, or you can protect, in fact, the exterior of the car, the paint of the car, which is acrylic coat of some sort. And now you'll analyze all that data and say, all right, is there a growth for that one? Can we create a market out of that one? Is it more profitable? And also, in fact, is there an entrenched competitor? So how do we protect the fabric of the car before this scotch car technology came about? What we do basically is basically put, in fact, some sort of a plastic cover. Remember plastic covers? By the way, I find that's the second worst design product. The first worst design product is swing sets that you are supposed to assemble at home. The instructions come out. You can do it in four hours. I've tried. Believe me, it takes a lot longer than four hours. There's always one screw missing. Have you seen that thing? One of the worst design products from a do-it-yourself viewpoint. Once you put this fabric and you put all those you know, uh, things inside, uh, you know, plastic things, guess what happens? You cannot take it off properly. So we knew that competition was so weak, highly unorganized, highly fragmented, we can attack there and come out with a scotch guard technology. Same thing, in fact, on the paint, the acrylic coat, one could come out. So now we have three product lines. But all of a sudden, more opportunities show up because you're thinking more from a disciplined diversification. A new car needs biggest protection against what? 
most new cars are sold in metro areas, what do you think is the biggest problem in metro areas? Biggest problem in metro area is theft. So can we come out with any device or anything that will be anti-theft or theft protection device or a technology? So you go back to your R&D guys, and remember, these are all chemical engineers, right? We talked about that one. And you say, and say, can you produce something else? Scotch guard type of approach, very easy. Acrylic coat, they're all chemical technologies. They can do it. Now we say, can you protect against theft? What do you think they will come out? They'll probably come out with a little mace spraying device next to the keyhole, right? Totally ineffective. So first lesson you learn is that you run out the core competency in the organization. But if you're an engineering-driven company which is going down, guess what? You will never believe you can't produce a product for any application. Typical problem. So we debated all this stuff. The strategy here was very clear. You have a market strength. You have a company reputation. Remember we talked about that one. You have a customer support organization through franchise. You have a massive distribution and sales organization. And you have an infrastructure, a logistic structure, a supply chain of some sort. So given that, you can now add more products, and therefore the best strategy would be to acquire a company that makes alarms, electronic alarm systems. And you better buy a company that is very good in technology, but not good in marketing. You will pay a lot less money, they will need you more, etc. And you take your brand name and put on that product and distribute through the same franchise system that you have created by and large. Makes a lot of sense. So we went through that analysis planning. Now the question came, all right, suppose the market is not big enough. The revenues and the numbers don't show very well. What else can we do with the car, new car? Well, the answer that came out through brainstorming session was that we can have a car customization business. What is the biggest thing a new car buyer wants that the factory guys don't do at the assembly level? In those days, it turned out to be sunroofs and moonroofs. In California, you've got to have moonroofs, OK? So we say, wow, this is a great market. Now, what technology do you need to cut roofs? It's a hacksaw technology, as I call it. <laughs> now, if you're a chemical engineer, this is a mechanical engineering. Obviously, there's no connectivity. There's no way you can do it. So you have to import the technology. You have to get the technology from outside. And you need to admit that you cannot do it yourself. Second biggest thing, in fact, a new automobile car uh, uh, buyer wants, which companies didn't offer, was customized stereo systems. You buy a Corvette, and you want 12 speakers in that little space. How do you do that thing? What you do is to put seats with speakers inside, remove the existing seats, very high value transaction, two, $3,000, as opposed to rust-proofing three, $400 transaction. Interestingly, and you can make money on that one. So we identified that. Then there are some new car buyers who want to change, stretch the car, you know, limo the car, like a limousine we do. They want to actually, in fact, add some design logo, et cetera, which is all chemical technology. So the point I'm making is that as you go horizontally, driven by your market strength, by your customers, you are going to become more and more versatile in different technologies. In this case, in the last box, you have to be both mechanical engineers, electronics engineers, and chemical engineers. And most companies can't do well. In fact, I've seen more failures going across, being driven by customers, than going down, driven by your technology. Isn't that fascinating? Only exceptions are in retailing. So a company like a Walmart, where they don't have to make the products, but just buy the products, they're able to go across any product category. I mean, you can sell anything through a Walmart system, whether it's uh, not just film processing business, or in fact, uh, drugs, for example, or anything, in fact, practically. I mean, there's an endless possibility for Walmart. And I already made a forecast that Walmart $250 billion largest corporation in the world is easy, in fact, for them to become a $500 billion easily. Because core competencies of making is already outsourced. So you don't have the trap that is built in, right? Interestingly. So that's one thing we talked about. Well, we said, all right, let's also analyze this chart, go down. What else can you rust proof 
than new cars? Obviously, the immediate answer would be the closest thing to a new car is an old car or used car. By the way, in those times in America, new car sales were about 6 million. Cars on the road were about 60 million, 10 times the market. There was already a German professor who had already been doing a lot of uh, consumer research and saying that in Germany or in Europe, as you know, they keep the cars longer. We change our ownership much faster. And therefore, the idea was that the car that was rust proofed once is not sufficient after four or five years. You must re rust proof it again. So there's a used market again. So he was promoting that idea. We latched onto the whole thing and we see we got all excited. And now you see another problem, another trap of the core competency theory. In this case, you are now searching for other applications, other markets, and guess what you do? <clears throat> you go back to your marketing people and simply say, do you think you can market to used cars? What do you think salespeople always say? They say, of course, yes, trust me. Every time I hear the word trust me from sales guy, I get nervous, I'll tell you that, okay? And that's the attitude of the engineers. Engineers don't trust salespeople. And it is true that most salespeople are so optimistic, you've got to be optimistic in sales function anyhow. That you exaggerate how good you are or how easy it is to conquer every market. We analyzed and we found used car market is so radically different than new car market. A new car, in the emotional excitement of buying the car, you do all the value add. You get insurance, you get this extra gadgets, features, and you say, yeah, I will do rust proofing. And the extra price you are paying is so small compared to the total cost of the car that you are willing to do that stuff. But for a used car, guess what? You are a very rational economic buyer now. It's a standalone transaction. And by the way, I found there are two things we fix in life in order to sell. What are the two things do you think? Uh, the first one is, everybody tells me, is a house. No question. If you want to sell your house, guess what do you do? You spruce up the yard, right? You do the painting, and you make sure all the nail holes are gone, and you keep the house ready for sale. The second thing I find is non-intuitive. Every time I see a male or a female professional friend of mine after several months, let's say it's a man in this case, and suddenly his beard is nicely trimmed, his body is a little more toned, he has gone to a you know, athletic club. Uh, he's dressing a little better. I know he got divorced. He's back in the market again, right? Interestingly, he's out there to sell himself. Very fascinating. So that's very interesting. That's a very rational decision making now. First marriage may be emotional. Second may not be emotional, you see? Same point. So this customer, while he looks like the same consumer, is very different. Motivations are very different. And salespeople often don't understand. So that's why I find more failures arise because of the overconfidence of the sales and marketing organization. So, but you can have a used car market. And then what else can you rust proof? You can rust proof motorcycle, bicycles. But if the unit cost of the original equipment is a lot lower than automobile, then the cost of rust proofing proportionately looks much bigger. So you have to buy, uh, think about units which are bigger in price uh, than the automobile. So it may be tractor, agricultural tractors, for example. It could be any industrial vehicle that's moving, you know, construction equipment, all this thing you can talk about. So we've identified a bunch of opportunities there. Now we go to the last box at the bottom, which says altogether new market. So suddenly we find out altogether new market is possible. If you're thinking about rust proofing, why think small? Why not think of rust proofing uh, you know, boats and ships? And if you think about rust proofing ships and boats, why think small again and think about the US Navy? So rust proofing uh, factories, rust proofing ships, it's all industrial rust proofing. But guess what? That ship will not come to your franchise location, please. You've got to take the rust proofing technology to where the location is. It's an industrial market, and most consumer sales guys don't know how to do industrial sales. Complete discontinuity. Just like hacksaw technology is not capability, cap capability that the chemical engineers have, 
the consumer franchise driven sales and marketing organization does not have the capability of selling to industrial customers. Now, if they had stayed in box number one and become an OEM supplier, which means automobile are their customers, automobile makers are their customers, and they did factory based rust proofing, there would have been perfect transition from box one to box three, for example, bypassing the used car market altogether. What do you think they did? Isn't that fascinating? Immediately conflict started. The Swedish CEO who was a young engineer, wanted to go down. He said, I'm in rust proofing business, I wanna stay focused and I wanna apply rust proofing everywhere possible. He was saying, I want to do OEM business. I do Volvo rust proofing. I can easily approach to Renault. I can approach to, in fact, Volkswagen, all the European car makers where he knew how to deal with them and eventually the American car makers. And by the time Chrysler was already making the noises that they would like to do rust proofing and offer that as additional uh, sort of a advertising differential thing to say, we rust proof the car, give you seven year guarantee and all the stuff. So market was emerging as, at, at the OEM level. That was his and he was absolutely insistent we go down. The franchise guy from Detroit, the son of the founder wanted to go across, interestingly, and he was absolutely sure he has to go across. So now what you have to do is to analyze which is your real strength, relative to competition or in absolute ways. So when I did the research on that one, I found the franchise operation was weak, it was not that strong. And therefore, loading more products on that one actually will collapse the organization. Franchises were not that loyal. There was a high turnover. You can easily get those measures. On the other hand, the chemicals they produced in the factory to do anti-corrosive uh, treatment was world class. So my recommendation was very clear. As an outsider, I simply said, since you can't go both ways, you don't have core competencies in both directions, I recommend you become primarily an industrial rust proofing company. Okay? And you can serve the automobile market by becoming an OEM supplier, remain in box one, but don't have these retail operations, which re require then immediately complete restructuring of the company by and large. So it is possible actually to use this chart as a way of growing the business and transforming the organization in the process pretty much. I hope you found this example useful. Let me see if I can come out with another example, which is much more obvious to all of us, and that has to do with McDonald's. If you look at the history of the company, it's interesting. It became by two brothers, McDonald brothers in California. Ray Kroc was a salesman for what I'm told is a sort of a milkshake machine or something like that. He found people who were waiting in line for hour, hour and a half, or whatever time it was, to buy because these guys made the best fresh hamburgers, obviously. So he said, there's a market opportunity, let me buy out. And Ray Kroc obviously bought the company and made it into this world-class enterprise that we know today. Uh, by the way, McDonald's is so good, despite all the recent criticism that it has encountered, it is really one of the best, best organizations. So again, if you do an analysis, McDonald's grew fascinatingly and fabulously. If you plot McDonald's now in this chart three by three matrix, which is the chart that you see, they are primarily in the luncheon because McDonald brothers only offer luncheon meal. And they're focused on end consumers, people who come, who consume, they pay, they buy. And of course, the two core competencies they have before Ray Kroc actually bought the company, basically is speed on operationally, they are very, very good in speed. Everything they measure is on speed. And from a customer viewpoint, what they offer is a value. For the dollar you spend, you get a better value from McDonald's products than anybody else. They stayed in the box and did wonderfully well by adding more products from hamburgers to french fries to uh, beverages to uh, salads, etc. And they've done a great job. That's the part that they've done very, very well. And actually, they're getting revitalized now again by going back into that box and adding more different menus, especially healthy menus more and more, and that's what they're doing it. Now, from there, they went, began to go across. Very interestingly, the new business was emerging. You have an infrastructure in place. 
which is 24 hours 7, but you're only using it during lunch time. It grew through a franchise system enormously. A lot of duplicators and imitators came in the market. Market grew completely, became a standalone fast food industry. So now you go across and say, what can I use this facility for? And at that time, we had a very good demographic trend. Back to my demographic uh, things that I talked about. For the first time, we had a working women households emerging in late 60s and early 70s. More and more women were working outside the family. And we still had a lot of baby boom effects, which means producing children. So the idea was that the wife needs a break. She's both a homemaker and a breadwinner. So why don't we take her out once a week or once a month, which turns out to be evening dinner. But where do you eat right now? Market is there. You can create a market, latent market into a real market, basically make versus buy decision now. You have a value proposition, which means a family can eat at McDonald's and still feel they don't have to break the bank. So you go out and you do the analysis, where are they eating their dinners? Turns out to be diners on the one hand or restaurants, sit down restaurants. And what's the problem in sit down restaurants? Children are not welcome here. Why do you think they created Ronald McDonald theme? They found a weakness. By the way, not only that, but all of those restaurants were strictly mom and pop one location. There was no scale economy, which is what McDonald did through franchise system. Buying power again, procurement of all the raw materials, ingredients, etc., to make foods. The rest is history. The dinner market was growing faster than the luncheon market. Luncheon market was saturated, dinner market was emerging. Higher margin because it's basically the same menu, but you charge prices higher for additional conveniences, etc. you offer. As opposed to just a takeout, it's a sit down and all the stuff. And that's what they did. So now you become two meals or main meals market. You offer both lunch and a dinner at the same time. And now the kids love it because you have this Ronald McDonald theme, etc. And guess what? You think the family will eat only once a month, the husband thinks, but actually the kids want to eat every day there, right? So the number of times same family visited again and again began to rise, almost like once a week phenomenon. Fantastic growth they created. Then they went into the last box more recently by saying that, all right, we also have the opportunity, again, demographic change. More women are working outside now than ever before. Nobody has time to eat any meals at home. There is no more hot meal left at home. They're all changing to cereals and snack bars and all the stuff. So they decided we can offer them actually a breakfast, a hot, good breakfast. Again, value proposition and speed. Remember, speed is very important because people are actually time poor more and more, not just money poor. So everything worked for them. And they came out with the breakfast menu, which, by the way, was faster growing, more profitable than the luncheon menu or even a dinner menu. And again, competition. Who is your competition? Competition is mostly donut shops, Dunkin' Donuts or Denny's restaurants, which are hard to reach. Dunkin' Donuts is nearby, but nobody wants to eat that donut anymore. It's not the right food to eat. So given all that thing, they went into the restaurant, I mean, the breakfast business, and rest is history. You offer three meals a day. You are working longer hours in the process, get more turn in your capital assets. And by the way, just as a side story, do you know that at one time, McDonald's was the largest real estate owning corporation in the nation? Isn't that interesting? Because they owned the real estate, and then they leased it out to the franchisee. It was on their books, on their balance sheet. Or one can look at them. In this case, the company has dual core competency. You can go down <clears throat> speed. They saturated the standalone franchise operations, real estate. They figured out there is no more good uh, location. And Ray Kroc was absolutely hung up on location. He wanted to be at the right location, very conservative in his attitude. So every time he chose a location, it was so conservatively chosen, it always made money for the franchisee. So they decided now to go into other people's locations, such as college cafeterias, high school cafeterias, airports. You have seen quite a lot of McDonald's as airports. Any place, in fact, where you have uh, an existing infrastructure, people are congregating, and you put a McDonald's shop. 
They even try to go into the inmate market, the prison system. They bid on the contracts. But guess what? They couldn't use their famous slogan, you need a break today, right? <laughs> I love that joke, okay? Interesting. <laughs> but they could not get that market. But they've gone everywhere. And then the last box altogether, new markets, of course, is to go internationally. Technically, they went internationally first before they went into institutional locations like shopping centers where you see McDonald's, you know, corporate cafeterias. We talked about all that thing. But they went into international, which has been very, very uh, good for them. Early entries were failures. They failed in Scandinavia miserably at one time, even though Northern Europeans are a beef-eating country by and large. And the reason is that they put McDonald's into suburban areas, which is great in America because everybody lives in suburbs, everybody has a car, whereas in Europe, you live in downtown and you must transit. They began to learn how to do it right. In fact, they began to put now more McDonald's in the center of the city and that the tourist traffic will also eat as well as the lunch and crowd will eat and they begin to revitalize. Their most successful McDonald's, I'm told, actually is in China. It serves, I'm told, 2,000 to 3,000 meals a day. Think about the process and the speed, you know, how you can do it. Talk about really scale, mass scale now. And that's the kind of a technology they are learning outside of this country and hopefully will bring in the country because they can now become basically at a very large convention conference where 1,000, 2,000 people have to be served meal very quickly. They can offer those uh, uh, possibilities. So they be, be in the convention business, et cetera, in America, for example, or in airlines. They can offer, in fact, not only kids' menu, which is how they began, but the main meal because now they can serve the food very fast into very large-scale operations, by and large. So McDonald's is able to go in both directions because it is both has a market core competency, brand reputation, logistical systems, customer service orientation, as well as, in fact, uh, the large distribution system, by, by and large, pretty much. And it also has a very good core competency on the product side, it is cost efficient. It can come out with menus with different prices, etc. It is highly mass customization that we talked about earlier. The product has value add things you can do. Product in this case is the location, the franchise, by and large, you can do many things with it. And just goes on and on pretty much. And by the way, just as a last comment, do you know what is the biggest, highest margin product at McDonald's always has been? It is not what they make or for which they became famous, the McDonald brothers, which is hamburger, but it turns out to be Coca-Cola. They are the largest customer of Coca-Cola. And it is the highest margin because they may charge, let's say, 79 cents per serving to a customer, and the cost of buying that one may be four or five cents, essentially. It's more margins than a credit card business. And by the way, same thing is happening as they've gone into the breakfast business or the dinner business. Guess what? At that time, people don't drink Coca-Cola or soft drinks in general. So what do you think they drink? They drink coffee. And coffee is even more high margin than soft drinks. Bottled water is even more high margin than soft drinks. Just goes on and on. So they have found a way of creating a margin mix in having this meal that they put together around a core product. They have found additional value add capabilities and they make enormous money. So we want to take these examples, and I can do the same thing for IBM. I can do, in fact, I've done this for many, many companies pretty much to show you that this is a generic framework with which one can talk about how do we grow our core business. Just to end the McDonald's story, remember what they're doing surprisingly while they've gone into almost all those boxes, they're going back to their core business and revitalizing their back again on the existing franchise operations adding new varieties of menus and products. And what you have heard in all the financial reports is that in the last year, they've made a huge turnaround very positively. So McDonald's is getting revitalized by going back to its core business pretty much, okay? So we can draw conclusions about this presentation. We have covered quite a lot of ground over time. A Lot of information was communicated. So let me just summarize for you. First point I want to make in my conclusion is that more and more companies are refocusing on the core business as a way of creating shareholder value. Rather than the old model of conglomerates and holding companies and diversification, they are now going back to the core business, partly driven by 
the stock market pressure, shareholder pressure, and partly driven by not being able to fight several fronts of competition, as we talked about. In order to grow the core business, they have to grow it profitably. Growing the core business profitably has become the key strategic focus for companies now. The synergistic acquisitions we talked about is one growth strategy in the core business. Key account management and vertical application markets or segments have become powerful tactics for growing the core business by and large. The next three strategies we talked about were growing the business by multiple channels, growing the business by multiple brand names. We talked about the Whirlpool example there for channels. We talked about the 3M company and the PC, and also growing the business by looking into the emerging markets. And we talked about the ethnic markets primarily as an emerging market as very large scale growing. And by the way, I do want to mention that one of the biggest growth opportunities for American corporations is going global. So many of these companies are simply saying, we have to go global. For example, 3M company suddenly realizes that they, will, they are likely to cross about a billion dollars of revenue in China. I heard recently the recent CEO, Jim McNerney, talk about how the growth for 3M company more and more will be China and India, emerging markets. And everybody's talking about the same thing. You talk to Cisco, they talk about the same thing. So emerging markets would be emerging markets in US, emerging markets, truly emerging nations by and large. And you might have read the report by Goldman Sachs called BRIC, B-R-I-C, which stands for Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Those are the four economies that will be the growth engine between now and the year 2050 is their econometric forecast by and large. So those are all the emerging markets, right? Additionally, uh, the companies have used, in order to succeed in the growing the core business, you need two core competencies. I emphasized again and again that most companies rely on one core competency, but like the body, like the brain, you have to be both left brain and right brain, left-handed and right-handed, etc. the same thing. One core competency is operational, technical, other core competency is marketing. You need both core competencies to really succeed. If you have one and not the other, you are not going to make as good an opportunity to grow the core business. If the core business defined by existing products and existing markets cannot be grown, then the company needs to have a growth strategy through what I have called the discipline diversification, not random diversification, not financial diversification, but a strategic diversification into either related products or related markets. Go across into box two or go down into box two. However, any discipline that diversification requires that it meets three criteria. Is the diversified business you want to go into growing faster than your core business? Is it more profitable than your core business? And there should be no entrenched competition. Point number eight, to grow the core business through related products or services requires marketing excellence, which means if you want to go across, you better be strong in your marketing competencies, as measured by business reputation, brand reputation, company reputation, sales excellence, market access, which is infrastructure, and world-class market uh, service, customer service kind of a thing. If you want to grow the business through related markets, requires operational excellence. It's a counterintuitive almost. In order to grow the markets, you better be good in your technology and your products and your operational excellence. And that can be measured by cost efficiency, product versatility, value added uh, capability of this platform that you have, and mass customization. Those are the four criteria I've identified as a way of measuring how good are we so that we can grow into the related diversification or discipline diversification as I talked about. Growing the core business through related products or related markets is easier to achieve because it requires incremental changes in the company's culture, processes, systems, and structure, which means those are just incremental changes, a little more investment, a little more tweaking, etc., and therefore it works very well. Generally, the odds of failing going into box number two are not that great. 
growing the core business through altogether new products or altogether new markets is a different cup of tea. It requires a radical discontinuous change. Many companies fail when they try to embark into this journey of growing through altogether new markets or altogether new uh, products by and large because the existing core competencies, operational and marketing, actually become core trap. In other words, they become your bottlenecks, they become your legacy, they become in fact a curse. It's the curse of the incumbent, as I call it, which is fascinating. It is more difficult to grow the core business which requires both a related product and related market changes, which is the box number four. Even though it is closer to box number one, the core business, it is much harder to do. So generally you are better off acquiring the business from outside than growing organically or internally. However, if you must grow the core business internally into box four, then my recommendation is that you go across box two, add a related product on existing customers, then go into related markets or you go into related market first and then add a product later on sequentially. It's very important, in fact, that you do in a two-step process rather than in a one-step process by and large. Just to wrap up this presentation, I hope this session has been very good learning experience and useful to you. I have learned a lot myself, in fact, by using this particular framework across several different uh, companies and industries, as I mentioned earlier. Thank you very much.